Hello, my name is Gil Penalosa and this is Cities for Everyone, the webinar. Every other Tuesday, I invite fascinating people from around the world to share experiences and knowledge that will help us create affordable, equitable, and sustainable cities. I was born in Bogota, Colombia, where as commissioner, I led the design and construction of over 200 parks and took a small program called Ciclovia, open streets, and increased it to over 120 kilometers, 75 miles of car-free streets every Sunday and holiday with more than a million people walk, bike, run, shop, enjoying the presence of each other. 17 years ago, I created 880 Cities, a nonprofit organization based in Toronto, Canada, where I live. Last year, I ran for mayor and came second with 100,000 votes. My aim was to change the conversation in creating a Toronto for everyone. I've been fortunate to have worked in over 350 cities in all continents, sharing and learning. Based on all experiences, I developed master classes and keynotes customized to each city. But Cities for Everyone, the webinar, is a way of giving back. It's always free and hopefully always interesting. Please invite others to join us every other Tuesday, anyone who cares about cities and people, equity and sustainability, about all living older, healthier and happier. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Gil Penalosa. And originally I'm from Bogota, Colombia, but I've been living in Toronto for about 24 years. And I'm the founder and chair of 880 Cities, as well as the founder of Cities for Everyone, which is more about advocacy. Today we have a fabulous session, a webinar with my very good friends, Eddie Greenberg and Ken Greenberg. I've known them for many years. Actually, Etty has been a member of our board of directors of 880 cities, and she has provided lots of help in many areas. And Ken is a renowned urbanist that has done lots of magnificent work, not only in Toronto, but across Canada and in many, many other countries. They have walked and biked almost every street of Toronto, gone through most of the play public spaces, and they have written a book. It's almost like a love letter from them to Toronto and to each other. And today they are our guests to share with us about Toronto and these beautiful public places, uh, which are what make our city a magnificent place to live. Ken and Etty, thank you very much and welcome. Thank you very much for accepting the invitation. And now everybody wants to hear from you. Okay, good morning. We're gonna share screen. Here we are. Can everybody see that? Yes. So thanks Gil okay. and good morning everybody or good evening wherever you happen to be. <laughs> um, this book came about because Etty and I during the time of COVID made a practice of exploring the city uh, on foot, on bike, and we ended up sending 52 postcards of all the places we visited. Uh, people liked it very much, suggested it could be a book. We did a book which has 28 places you'll hear about, and today we're going to talk about eight. <laughs> so we have a tandem bicycle. This bicycle is 60 years old. It was a gift from my parents. And we are the demonstration of 880 cities. Etty and I are both turning 79 this month. So we keep urging Gil to actually think about lifting the upper limit. We're in a city, Toronto, which is undergoing enormous change. Um, it is the fastest growing large city in North America by a significant amount. And that includes Mexico City. And how that growth is occurring is one of the things that is shaping public space. This is also extremely interesting. We have become the most diverse city in the, on the planet. Over 50% of us, as Gil mentioned, were born in another city. Over 50% identify as visible minorities. This photograph is from a, an area um, that has 
changed. It was a distillery on the east end of the city. And in the 1930s, the men, and they were all men, as you can <laughs> see, who worked at the distillery, lined themselves up against the wall and took this group photo. Almost all of them were from the British Isles. If you look below, the people who work in the distillery, which has become a kind of arts and culture district today, replicated that photograph. And what's extraordinary about Toronto is unlike almost every other place in the world, almost all Torontonians, all demographics, all ages, all parts of the city will say that diversity is the most positive thing about our city. We are also, like cities around the world, trying to reconnect with our natural environment. Gil mentioned the fact that 17% of our land area is in the form of these ravines and valleys from the water recharge area at the top of the slide called the Oak Ridges Moraine, draining down into Lake Ontario. And in this moment of climate change, that relationship is crucial. We are also, like cities around the world, in the throes of weaning ourselves from car dependence, uh, attempting in myriad ways to get people back on bikes, active transportation, shift to transit. We cannot handle the growth in population based on the automobile. And then finally, this is another challenge. The, if the cars were the big technological challenge right after World War II, the technological challenge now from the internet to AI is retaining our humanity in terms of human contact. On the left, you see a typical Starbucks. Starbucks are of course designed for people to be alone on their phones, their tablets, <laughs> their laptops. On the right is our, one of our favorite local cafes, which indeed has technology, but it has these skinny one foot or 30 centimeter wide tables so people actually connect with each other. So public space design at a microcosm. This quote is kind of the inspiration for our book by Aimé César, poet and former president of Martinique. I have a different idea of a universal. It is of a universal rich with all that is particular which with all the particulars there are, the deepening of each particular, the coexistence of them all. So this has truly impressed us. And what we're going to talk about is those particulars. These are the, this is from the book. This is the map of the 28 places we looked at. They're in the center of the city. They're also in the suburbs. They all have really amazing backstories, which we tell in the book. There are layers, there are palimpsests, there are serial creations. They have traces as they become what they are today. And we talk about the people who created them. Uh, among the 28, we have an historic park, a floodplain, a main street, houses, lanes, rail to trail, undercroft of a highway, a neighborhood market, and transformation of a public housing project. So those are the eight we're gonna take out of the 28 to talk to you about today. Here are some images just to give you a sense of the enormous variety of those places. Oh, cool. And we're gonna start with this one. This is a plan that was done for the park that we live on right in the middle of the slide called Victoria Memorial Square. In the middle of that, you see that little rectangle, which is at an angle that's on a new uh, true north-south axis. That was a burial ground for a nearby fort that was protecting the harbor. In 1834, when this plan was done, the city expanded into this area all around a public space called Wellington Place, which was two squares connected by a linear park called Wellington Place. What happened is the railways came in at the bottom of the slide in the middle of the 19th century. And rather than becoming the area that was intended, it became an industrial area which climaxed in mid 20th century. And at that point, a lot of the industry departed and you can see a lot of parking. But toward the end of the 20th century, life came back and working with Jane Jacobs, we devised a plan to eliminate land use zoning and to allow people to come back and live in the area. And in the lower slide, you see a building at the edge of this park. That's where we are talking to you from Six now. Years. And so in 2002, the community, which we are part of, commissioned a landscape plan 
to bring this park back to life. And you can see the rectangle of the burial ground very clearly indicated here and a whole bunch of features that made this more amenable to the kind of life that was returning. This is a wonderful letter from Jane Jacobs written in October of 2002. I'll just read it to you quickly. With gratitude to the Wellington Place Neighborhood Association, Victoria Memorial Square will be an urban jewel rescued from a wasteland of neglect and forgetfulness. It, beautif it beautifully ties the city's earliest roots into a living, caring, revitalized community. The whole city is made richer by this enlightened and enchanting act of stewardship. We're very proud of that. So this is what it looks like. And especially during the time of COVID, it became a vital outdoor living room for people moving into all the development, which you can see here as the population has increased dramatically. This is a slide of the 500 meter long, 45 meter wide stretch of Wellington Street connecting the two squares. Go back to that 1834 plan, 189 year old plan is finally being realized with moving from parking lots to narrowing the roadway and creating the linear park that was always intended back in 1834. This is the Portlands. And here's another story, a backstory. In 1912, the Toronto Harbor Commission created the industrial area or wannabe industrial area that you see in the slide. And they created a right angle channel of a river that fed the largest wetland in the Great Lakes, which was filled in. They called it a swamp. It, in its state that you see in this photograph, created a flooding danger for the whole downtown of the city. And so Waterfront Toronto, a multi-level agency representing all three levels of government and the city held an international competition. I entered the competition with my esteemed colleague, Michael Van Valkenburg, landscape architect. We won, and this was our design, which created a park as the floodproofing protection with perched wetlands, uh, with the ability for the river to expand and contract and three ways in which the water could find its way into the harbor. Uh, this is the plan that is currently being built for 80 acres of parkland. Here it is under construction. This is a $1.2 billion effort. Um, it will be magnificent. It will open in 2025. And there are a series of bridges that of course is Etty on the bridge. The bridges are being designed as public spaces, not just bridges. So I worked with Grimshaw from London and Intuitive, the engineers. Uh, the space allocated to cyclists and pedestrians is wider than the space allocated to cars. And there's a twinning for public transit. And these are, there are four of these bridges and they become these great belvedere's or miradors overlooking the park. So as I'm showing you all these, they, and think of that universal particular, there are examples of these things in all of your cities as well. These are very special to Toronto, but I'm sure you can think of parallels. The next I'm gonna show you the key feature of the DNA of Toronto, which is our streetcar main streets. This one happens to be called Roncesvalles, in Spanish, Roncesvalles, <laughs> uh, the Valley of Thorns. I'm not sure why it got that name. This is what these were like in the 1960s, pretty much dominated by traffic, although we kept the streetcars. And today, as the city changes, they're taking on this incredible patina of life um, as they become more oriented to pedestrians, to cyclists, um, and to all this extraordinary effusion of daily life. And there are hundreds of kilometers of these streets that define the city. Here are some houses. And I'm showing you these extraordinary houses because one of the features of Toronto with, with our incredible diversity is a live and let live attitude in which people can express their unique personalities. These are extreme examples, if you like, but all of the front gardens of the houses in the older neighborhoods of Toronto have a striking individual personality. Uh, this gentleman named Parashos obviously comes from Greece. This is one uh, done by a 
construction worker who had uh, an accident that prevented him from continuing his work in the trades. His name is Albino Carrera. And with the help of his neighbors who donated a lot of these objects, he created this extraordinary sculpture garden in his front garden. And here's one done by an art student at OCAD University who created this three meter high elephant and donated to a friend. So as you wander the streets of Toronto, and we talk about this in the book, the street is actually a kind of outdoor museum and also a lexicon of extraordinary front gardens from all over the world. The next has our laneways. We have 250 kilometers, ignore the phone, it will stop in two rings, <laughs> 250 kilometers of these laneways which traverse the city. Etty was part of a project called the Laneway Project to reactivate these laneways as the city has grown denser. Um, this is one of uh, the famous ones called Rush Lane, which has become a kind of outdoor art gallery. And they're now being put to all kinds of incredible uses. Uh, both we now permit laneway houses as of right on all the laneways, but also as public spaces. And historically, in the upper left, you see an historic example of that. We now have contemporary examples and the laneways as this web of public spaces for active transportation and for the kind of uses you see here. Here's another palimpsest. This is a 19th century in the 1890s for a couple of years only. This was a commuter rail train that linked a whole series of villages outside the city. It didn't last very long for commercial reasons. And it has now been transformed through the work of my urban design group at the city into this wonderful uh, network of greenways that traverse the city almost for the length of a marathon. Here's one of our favorite projects. This is called the Bentway. This is the elevated expressway that was built across the city through an industrial area, purely industrial area in mid 20th century. And the undercroft of this expressway was sitting there unused, as you see in the image on the upper left. Um, in 2015, through the intervention of some dear friends of ours who are great philanthropists with an interest in public space, they responded to an article I had written in 2011, uh, identifying this as a possible central park for about 125,000 people who were moving into new high rise neighborhoods surrounding this area. And so you see some of the images of the incredible mix of uses of this in all seasons, including at the lower right, at the leading one of her Tai Chi classes. And sitting under this highway uh, does something unique for the spirit. It's the contrast of the space, which is actually uh, been transformed in the popular imagination from something kind of ugly and off-putting, a no man's land, into something quite beautiful and enchanting. Uh, communal dinners happen under the space all summer long, hosted by different communities in the city. We just attended one, which was uh, the food was prepared by five recent immigrant, all women, from different countries, each of whom prepared a specialty dish from their country. We ended up sitting at a table and surrounding us were uh, a couple, um, the first couple that joined us, her parents were Iraqi and an Ashkenazi Jew, a Muslim and a Jew. Her husband was an Italo-Canadian. Italo the next couple uh, was a younger couple. He was from Hong Kong. She was from Mexico. <laughs> that's, that's who you see in this image, all the people of Toronto getting yeah. together to break bread. This idea of what's called the Bentway is now going to extend for seven kilometers across the entire city. Now I get to the neighborhood market. In the 1930s, during the Depression, this was an area where Jewish immigrants who were employed in the garment industry lived. They lost their jobs. They opened the fronts of their houses illegally at the time to create these store, this storefront market, this famous market. And ever since, every level of people who've come to the city 
all the different immigrant communities have come and established their presence using this as a great social space and really a space of experimentation where all kinds of new things happen to the city. So invariably all visitors to the city end up in Kensington Market. And here it is today with one of our favorite friends, Tom's Place, he's been selling clothing there for 50 years and you can see some images in his storefront windows of what the market used to be. This is a public housing project built in mid 20th century called Regent Park, even though it didn't have a park. Very typical, I think you might say to many of the cities you're coming from, it was mean and lean and clearly not conducive to community life, two huge super blocks. The plan with it, which I worked on with the local community started in 2002, simply ran the grid of the city right through the park, through the, uh, the lands of this public housing project, introducing mixed income housing, more than doubling the density and introducing finally the parks, which the name had suggested, but which never existed. This is the plan, it's about two thirds implemented. And what's amazing is all the things that have appeared in the last 20 years that were never anticipated including at the lower right, a cricket pitch because of the people who actually live there, very popular sport, what is arguably the most beautiful uh, swimming pool in the city, the aquatic center, uh, a center for the arts, a birthing center, and just an endless number of things that have materialized. And this is the, the spectrum, uh, which includes space for about 35 arts organizations, which is really at the heart of the city and the social development program has turned out to be the thing that has made it successful. Here's an image where you cannot tell all of the housing is built in such a way that it's impossible to tell which is the social housing, which is the market housing. On the right-hand slide is a youth center for adolescents in the community, very famous uh, basketball, very well-used basketball court and then the mix of housing types. And then I'm gonna end with these images. And these go back to all the key pressures we were under, the extraordinary population growth, growing for a diverse society, continuing to make a virtue of that diversity and dealing with issues of equity and inclusion. And of course, this incredible emphasis on public life. And with that, Gil, I'm going to stop sharing. And Ken, what a lovely session. Thank you very much. I wish you, I, I wish you much success with the book and hope to see you very soon. Take care. Yes. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye you. all. Thank you very, very much. What a magnificent presentation. I love your emphasis that cities should share with each other how they transform public places, what works, what doesn't, because at the end of the day, it makes everybody better. I think this presentation that you have made has had a huge impact of everyone. Even those of us that live in Toronto, we wanna go back to those places. We felt so proud as you were going one by one by one and telling why is it that they are special? And people from all over the world, we have people today from Kenya, uh, from uh, Norway, from Sweden, from Paraguay, from Mexico, many from across the U.S., from across Canada, they will want to come to Toronto to see it. But this was a, an amazing lesson on public places, why they, they are so special, and why is it good to walk and bike exploring our cities. Eti and Ken, thank you. And I will, of course, I want to thank all of the participants from all around the world that every other week are here. Please, the videos are alive two days after at gpenalosa.ca. Share it with decision makers, with your friends, with anybody that you think will be able to use and learn and then become a passionate advocate for cities that are more equitable and sustainable. Thank you.